أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the universe, the master of the day of judgment. I bear witness and testimony to the oneness of Allah, to his magnificence, his omnipotence, his might, his glory, to his being the creator and sustainer of all things, the giver of life, the guider of hearts, the master of the day of judgment. I bear witness to the fact that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the servant and final messenger, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and upon all those who choose to tread in his path until the last day. It is said that solitude was a regular part of the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam's habit, his schedule. That even prior to his receiving of revelation, he would separate himself from the Meccan society in which he lived so that he could better understand how that society functioned and more importantly, what his role was within it. That on a consistent basis, he made sure to find for himself moments of stillness, moments of reflection, moments of contemplation, that took him away not from people, took him away not from his loved ones and the people he had a deep attachment to, but took him away from distractions. And in a city like the city that we live in, in a space surrounded by so much noise and chaos, in a world that is teaching us to constantly just chase and chase and chase in pursuit of sometimes we don't even know, the imperative more so than at any other time for each of us individually is to make time for our hearts and to watch over them so that they in turn watch over us as well. Everything in this tradition emphasizes a relationship with the divine. And the fundamental part to us that becomes the connecting point to God is that morsel of flesh that beats deeply within us, the spiritual heart. That indeed in your jasad, in your being, there's a morsel of flesh. If it is good, the entire being will be good. If it is not good, the entire being will not be good. Indeed, it's your heart. Another hadith, inna lillahi ta'ala aniyatan min ahl al-ard. Indeed, for your Lord, there are vessels amongst the people of the earth. Wa aniyatu rabbikum kulubu ibadihi salihin. And the vessels of your Lord are the hearts of his righteous servants. Ahabbuha, alyanuha, wa rafuha. The ones that he loves the most are the most soft and tender. May Allah grant us hearts that are soft and tender. The emphasis in the materialistic existence is one that is quite focused on externals alone. But the need to have inward development necessitates having a relationship with the inward. And to be in a space where you are comfortable and at peace in solitude necessitates also at times just being able to be alone with yourself. And that's hard when everything just pulls us in different directions. Everything is about stimulation that is in immediate gratification. When was the last time you sat just you with you? No devices, no conversations, just in silence. And how long did that go for? When the exhaustion sets in and the debilitation sets in, emotions come in control and we are no longer in control of them. 
everything just seems to be going into a state of spiral. And I don't know how to make decisions or choices. It all comes back to thinking about the state of that self. And one of the key variables is to make sure that you are taking time to just be in a place of stillness. We can get pulled in all different directions for all different types of reasons. There's a man by the name of Joshua Bell who is once conducting a social experiment with a local newspaper in the Baltimore area. Joshua Bell, he stands on a subway platform, not so different from the trains that we have in New York City. And during rush hour, opens up his violin case and starts to play his violin. And for two or three hours, he stands on that platform and person after person just passes him by. He says in the few hours that he's there, there was children who where they came to stand in front of him, they would just stare. And the adults that were with them had to drag them away. He said, I could see those kids still looking at me over their shoulder. He said, one elder man, he stopped for a few moments, took a pause, and then and he too just went on. And in the few hours that he was there, he said he collected probably just 10 or $20. What makes this remarkable is that this man, Joshua Bell, he is considered to be one of the foremost practitioners of the violin in the world. That in that surrounding area in the days prior and the days after, he sold out concert hall after concert hall, where tickets were valued at hundreds of dollars. The violin he played that day that violin itself was valued at $2 million. And all these people had an opportunity to engage in that moment of beauty, a moment that they would likely go home and tell their family about and their children's children about and their coworkers about. But all of them passed it by because they were getting pulled by something else. What distracts you? What makes you go? What takes hold of your attentiveness? What is so important that it doesn't allow for you to rest or take moments to breathe? We live in a world where, aside from the spiritual inward, the physical inward isn't even understood to be a priority. You can walk on the streets and you see people who are putting all kinds of stuff into their bodies and not even substances that are problematic, but foods that nobody should be eating. Not with a consideration of what it's doing to physical organs, the heart, the liver, the stomach, any of those things. It doesn't go into my head when I'm thinking about what I'm eating. What is this actually doing to my body? We're not thinking about the physical self and the implications of certain things. And who's going to be actually thinking about the spiritual self? The parts that are not tangible, but they're still there. We have everybody move up. If we can move in this way as well, we're not blocking the door. Within the prism of modernity, there's so much gain. We literally have landed on planets that nobody thought we could. We can understand things to their most subatomic levels, universes that are minuscule and grand beyond our ability to fathom. We've been able to engage in technological advancements and scientific discovery that's really remarkable. But also in the prism of modernity, there are gaps. And one of the things that we see in the prism of modernity is a decreasing and diminishing of places of stillness, places of reflection. 
you look into our spiritual history and you see individuals who built solitude into their routines. We talk about time management being self-management in last week's chutzpah. You now want to start to instill points within your routine that prioritize and taking moments for yourself and stillness are important. Musa alayhi salam, Moses, peace be upon him. He leaves from the children of Israel for 40 days. Maryam, peace be upon her. Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon them both. She goes and seeks solitude in a temple at a time when, let alone women not going into a temple, most people weren't finding that type of solitude. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam would regularly go. He is at the cave of Hira, atop of a mountain, seeking solitude when the angel Gabriel comes for the first time. The dimensions of that solitude are important to understand. Because in each of these moments and so many more, it's when they're in those spaces and they have found rest and an ability to be away from distractions so they can ponder and see what is it that I'm really putting my life into. Big things start to happen for them. Musa alayhi salam, Moses, peace be upon him, in his solitude, 40 days away, he speaks with Allah Zawjad. Maryam, peace be upon her, the mother of Isa alayhi salam, when she is in that temple, food and food comes from nowhere. Zakaria alayhi salam says, where did this come from? She says, it came from God. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his solitude, gets his first revelation. And their solitude is not about escapes from reality. Because as each one left, they came back to the people that they served. It was about enhancing the inward and seeing an outlet, not as running away, but for a means of rejuvenation. The heart, it gets attached in many different ways. The most generic form of love in Arabic is called mahabba, hub. And it's a kind of love that categorically you can have feelings within yourself, but you don't have to express them or show people. In English, we lose a lot of nuance and translation. And a lot of us, we don't increase our vocabulary as much as we could. And so we become limited in understanding the meanings of things through just the words that we know. There's a lot of different ways to understand love. But in the prism of this conversation, the heart is going to love what you put in its presence. And the first phase of love that a heart goes through is called alaka, that it gets linked to what its beloved is. That if you speak Urdu or Hindi, there's cognates like the word ta'alluq. We keep relations with each other. It means you're linked to people. The heart gets linked to something. The second phase of love that the heart goes through is called irada, that it now commissions the body to go seek out its beloved. The third phase is called sababa, that in Arabic, when we pour water in a cup, you say sabab al ma, the water is falling in the cup, literally. And sababa is falling in love the way the water falls. You can't do anything, you're just falling into it. The fourth phase is called gharam, that the love becomes so intense within you, you just have to be with your beloved. Those first four phases of love, they're a very nafsi love, a very self-serving love, an egocentric love. The next phase of love is called mawadda, which is the first step of an unconditional love. It's the kind of love that God identifies his love through when he calls himself al-wadud, the source of love, the giver of love. Because God is the source of love, does not love his creation because they come from a particular culture or context or espouse a certain creed. God simply loves his creation because he loves his creation. 
a perfect love that embraces us in all of our diversity and takes us in despite any imperfection that we might have, just as any perfect love would. In terms of practice, it's also the first step of a love that has mindfulness and presence to it. And it's not just a love that I have for another person or a love that I have for my kids or my wife. Here's my 10th wedding anniversary, by the way. So make do out. Going strong. There's a guy that I saw on the bus when I was coming over from Dermis of Green. We pulled up at Broadway and he came and stood next to me. I was standing near the door. He kind of was up against the glass and nudged me a bit. And I looked at him, and before I saw him, he was about a foot and a half taller than me. I was about to say, why are you pushing me? And I was like, okay, let me let this be. He can step on me. In my head, I'm thinking, what is he running towards? Where is he going? And then the door opens, and there's a young woman standing outside, and he goes to her, and they embrace one another. I said, on my wedding anniversary, I'm not going to get mad at somebody who's excited because he has a care for someone. That's not the only things that you can fall in love with, though. You can fall in things in love that are not healthy for you. You can build a love for the pursuit of wealth, and you become a worshiper of money. And then nothing is going to satisfy you. Nothing is going to make you feel good. The Hadith says that the child of Adam, the son of Adam, you give him a mountain of gold, he's going to go seek another mountain. You can love physical beauty so much, and not just in the other, but in yourself, that you become a worshiper now of the physical self. And then as you old, you get aged and get older, you're going to find your inside die again and again and again, because you're not going to know how to deal with the fact that the wrinkles come and that the inconsistencies come, you won't be able to find beauty in your aging self. But when you can get to a place where you're able to sit and to able to contemplate and say, why am I chasing after what I'm chasing after? Why am I going in pursuit of these things and what is it giving to me? If you don't build into the routine that you have now, the moments where you just take steps back to reflect and be still, to think about what's going well and why is that, to think about what is not going well and why is that, to be able to put the best of yourself into a state of conclusion so that it's not just with immediacy that you're choosing and making choices on perspective, as well as actions that are undertaken through perspective. Even after revelation comes to the Messenger وسلم, he builds solitude into his routine regularly. In Ramadan, you see the practice of what we call the etzikah. And you have individuals who would seek solitude in the masjid for the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And they will make us from those who reach Ramadan and benefit from its blessings. And you want to start to think about it now, because just because it's months away doesn't mean that it's not something to start to extrapolate meaning from. Per annum, he would regularly go to seek that. And when you are seeking itikaf, it's not that you are sitting alone by yourself in the middle of a desert. You are in a masjid surrounded by people. Because it's not about being away from people. It's about being away from distractions. So that what you are consuming is not what you chase after every day that's giving you temporary satisfaction, but it's giving you the ability to think deeply from your mind and your heart. Ours is a tradition that appeals to a higher level of ethics and consciousness. Literally, when you stand, you can see within yourself an illustration of where you want to make your choices from. Your lower self is where the regions are of your stomach and sexual organs. Your higher self is where your heart and your mind is. 
That's what you want to appeal to. And in a world that is purely a fixated on physical and material gain, it's telling you constantly to deny the higher self and live in a space that is beneath you. So you sit for a minute and you just engage in contemplation and reflection. You build it into your routine because you don't have to do it by yourself. Solitude and being alone is not loneliness. They're two very different things. You find a buddy, a friend, that you can be in a state of ease with. And you go and find comforts and spaces that are not hours and weeks and months at a time, but even just a few minutes in your routine that you can sit and gather yourself in a way to elevate that. The first time I did Etikaf, and Etikaf is a seclusion in the mosque, in the masjid, that Muslims do as per our tradition within the last 10 nights of Ramadan. I was a freshman in NYU the first time I did that practice. I was 18 years old. I'd only started to think about what religion means to me, I was trying to figure out any of it. And back then, Ramadan was during winter break. You can tell how old I am, it was a long time ago. And because it was over the winter break, a lot of massages, they were filled with young people, just like this gathering here. You don't want to wait till you're much older because one, our theology says you don't know when your time is coming. And you don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. And at 18, I went into that masjid and I sat with people and I was in a space now where I wasn't watching anything that was problematic. I wasn't hearing anything that was problematic. I was literally not eating so much because I was fasting. But not just seeing and hearing in the sense of what we might assume. I'm not talking just about what you watch on TV or the music you pump through your ears that are filled with objectifications of women and cursing and this kind of stuff. I'm talking about, I wasn't hearing anybody yell at anybody else. I wasn't hearing anybody be racist to anybody else. I wasn't seeing television screens that were pumped with headlines that were saying that I didn't belong in this country. I wasn't in a space where social media was bombarding me and stimulating with me with all kinds of egocentricity and selfish greed and marketing ploys to tell me that what I need for happiness is to buy what somebody's selling me. All I was hearing was Quran being recited. I was seeing everybody give salams to everyone else. Can we have everyone move up again just one time? <clears throat> Maybe we can start sending people to the home club. It's just it's a thought. You guys want to move over this way too? It felt good, but the only way that I understood truly what the impact was of that solitude is when I left it. And I walked out of that masjid, the space of solitude that I had chosen for myself. And I remember the first time my parents, they took me after to get some food at a restaurant nearby. And I heard a husband yelling at his wife. And it just pierced my heart. I hadn't heard anything like that for 10 days. When I walked down the streets, everything was something that I had seen for so long, but it now looks different. That's what that period of rest will do for you. That's what that solitude will do for you. Where we have in our tradition concepts like seeking solitude embedded in it. You just take a reset. You do not design your life. Someone else will design it for you. 
you're constantly in a stage where you are in pursuit of things that are just for your physical. And you're not bringing your mind and your heart into determining what are these things that I keep banging my head against. It's just going to be continuous again and again and again. Allah made us creatures with the capacity to think. It's not unique that anyone has thoughts because everyone has thoughts. Consciousness is about the ability to claim what you think about and how you think about the things that you're thinking about. You don't go to default settings and just run on autopilot. Build into your routines some time for reflection. Sheikh Aisha and the Dars before Juma, that all of you should be coming to. 1230, Sheikh Faaz, Sheikh Aisha, every other week, dropping gems that are not just about let me sit and listen. Because you're not here to be entertained. You're here to learn how to move forward in your existence in this world so that it becomes the means through which you get the best in the world beyond this world. She shared with us the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ tells us that on this day of Juma, there is a time in which if you make dua, that dua is answered. And Allah will make us amongst those who witness that prayer. And she said that that comes in after the Asr prayer time. You can only take advantage of it if you're making the time for it. And to then be able to just be still after the prayer is done. You don't just rush to get to wherever the next place is that you're going, that your heart is calling you to. But you allow for yourself to start to be as present as possible. You move with that presence in your decision-making, in your choices. Is it an absolute solution? No. Your physical self, emotional self, mental self, spiritual self, they all have overlap with each other. But this practice, amongst many other things, is one that will have deep impact if you allow for it to be something that you engage in. Don't take your cues from everybody else. <clears throat> is completely running after dunya and saying that that's what it is that I want to gain. If you want to know what your heart is attached to, on this day of Jummah, you sit down when the fard prayer is done and just think about what are the things that you normally pray for? I've been to Mecca a bunch of times and Allah grant us the invitation to visit his house again. To visit the illuminated city of his beloved Sallallahu and end the oppression and injustices that come from that country. And I've seen people hanging from the door of the Kaaba, literally pulling themselves by the sheets on it. And all they're making to off for is dunya, man. And I've sat with people who are in parts of this world that if somebody saw someone sitting in those spaces, they wouldn't say that those are places for the pious. We look for every reason to exert arrogance and condescension and judgmentalness. And the du'as that they make, the prayers that they utter, they're filled with such beauty and purity. If you're looking for something to do in that first moment of reflection, Ask yourself, why do I pray for what I pray for? Why am I not praying for what I'm not praying for? Whose names are not present in my du'a? And what is it that my du'a is telling me is important to me and is a priority to me? And in those other moments of solitude, you rest and you reflect and contemplate more. But you build it as an exercise, a practice, a habit. So that you start watching over your heart. Inshallah ta'ala, your heart starts watching over you.
ان الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا مولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله We have some guests here with us today uh, at the invitation of our Washington Square MSA. Uh, and after the Juma prayer is done, there's going to be a discussion to talk about Muslim student experiences here on campus. And so stick around so that you can participate and share your thoughts and ideas. And anytime you want to bring friends, you want to invite your classes, you want to invite other people from campus to attend, so long as people fit within the entrance policy of NYU's COVID guidelines right now, the Juma prayer here is something that you should feel welcome to bring to the community. True gatherings of the divine, they're based off of principles of inclusivity, not exclusivity. Human gatherings, they're about not just who we let in, but who we keep out. How can we let this person marry this person? How can we allow this person to eat a meal in our home? How can we pray behind somebody that's like this? Or even pray side by side with them. But in Allah's gatherings, you have people from all walks of life and all backgrounds. And that's the distinction. So don't hesitate inviting people that you want to have come. It's our honor and privilege to host people here in moments like this. And so if you can stay after and participate in the discussion with the MSA, we're going to be running uh, with the guests who are here today. We continue to invite people in, inshallah. We're going to be continuing all of our halakas over the course of the coming week. And other programs have started as well, which you're getting notifications of via email. Continue to come and be present in those spaces and let us know of other things that we could be doing, uh, any feedback or suggestions, things that you have, inshallah ta'ala, we'll do our best to facilitate. And as I said last week, and I'll keep reiterating as people start to get accustomed to the space here, our staff is here for you. So if any of you need anything, looking for someone to talk to, someone to listen. You can reach out to us at really any time. We'd be happy to set up times to hear you, what's going on, and try to figure out where we can be a resource. And so some of your classmates have reached out with challenges around housing. Some are dealing with financial aid issues or classroom problems. Others with family issues, others with relationship issues, others struggling with their own wellness overall, some dealing with grief and bereavement, some dealing with being away from home for the first time, some trying to just really figure out how to be Muslim when everyone around them is not the same kind of Muslim as they are. Perhaps we'll listen to anything about And I know a lot of our guests who are here today from the Spiritual Life Center and our members of our broader spiritual life community, they're more than happy to do that as well. So let us know what we can be doing for you. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll do our best to serve you in whatever way we can do. Inna Allah wa malaika sahu yusalluna ala nabi يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسلما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وفي الآخرين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاف عنا يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم اجعلنا من المخلصين اللهم اجعلنا من المخلصين اللهم اجعلنا من المخلصين we begin this supplication in your name ya allah we beseech you to send your choicest salutations upon your most beloved sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam 
We ask that you shower your infinite mercy upon this gathering, granting each and every one who is present herein and our loved ones only the best in this world and the best in the next. We ask Allah that if all of us are meant to be together only at this time, at this place, whether we are young or old, male or female, regardless of our race, our ethnicity, our social class, our country of origin, our cultural heritage, whether we are Muslim or come from a different walk of life, Ya Rabbi, if our individual hearts are meant to be in the presence of all of their hearts that are gathered here only at this time, at this place, we gather us all together again in the best of places in the world beyond this one. Increase us, Ya Allah, in all that is good. Increase us in courage, compassion, and confidence. Protect us from any affliction, anxiety, or anguish. Remove from our hearts any feelings of bitterness, jealousy, animosity, or envy towards any of your creation. Grant us hearts that are filled with understanding and hope. Hearts that are drawn towards things of real goodness and beauty. Hearts that find themselves deep in your remembrance, for indeed in your remembrance do hearts find rest. We ask Ya Allah that you make us from amongst those who take full benefit from this blessed day of Jummah. That you seize every opening that you set forth for us for our gain and our benefit. Let not this day end without us being a means of goodness for someone else and for ourselves. Make us a means that Allah in which we give only that which is good for your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, feed your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, clothe your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, give shelter to your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, give strength to your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, give hope to your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, be generous to your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, be merciful to your creation. Through us, Ya Allah, love your creation. Make us from amongst those who have a deep love for ourselves, so that we might go with courage and confidence and give to this world everything that is in need of. Make us, Ya Rabb, the reason that people have hope in this world, and never the reason that people might dread it. Protect us always from hearts that are not humble, tongues that are not wise, and eyes that have forgotten how to cry. Forgive us for our shortcomings and guide and bless us all. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim. Wa tub alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawab al-raheem. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khari khalfihi muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin. Wa akimu salah.